My dad and I are going to share about our journey together of me coming out and then us studying the Bible together. Because I think for most Christian parents who are struggling after finding out that their child is LGBTQ, their understanding of the Bible is very high on the list of their concerns, if not at the very top of the list of their concerns. So Greg and Lynn asked me to share some about scripture on this topic, and I thought that the best way to do it would be in narrative form with my dad, since this is our Parents in Process program, and since that was really how our study of this topic unfolded together. Um, and I know that that's a real privilege and blessing that I had, thanks to my dad, because a lot of people, when they come out, don't have enough openness from their parents to even be willing to really explore this topic in more detail. And so I'm very grateful to my dad for that. And I'm looking forward to being able to share this with you and then we'll take some questions at the end. So to get started, I'll just share a little bit about, we'll just share a little bit about our background, what led to me coming out. I grew up in this man's home. <laughs> Um, and a, it was a Christian home, and that was the most important part of what our home and family was about, um, still is. <laughs> and in Wichita, Kansas, a church of about 2,000 people, a Presbyterian church, my parents, I'll let my dad tell you more about their involvement in the church, but I became a Christian when I was three years old. It was actually only my second memory because they told us in Sunday school that morning, that all we had to do was ask Jesus to come into our heart and to be our Lord and Savior, and he would do it. And so as I, as was, I was riding back home from church that Sunday, it was quiet, and I just did exactly what they told me to do. And I asked him to come into my heart, and I did. I drew a little door <laughs> on my heart. I just think, very cute, but it's also real. Um, <laughs> I, I drew a little door on my heart, and I opened it. And I kept it open for a full minute to make sure he had time. Because <laughs> I felt like he was coming from a distance. <laughs> and so he needed some time. <laughs> but also he could get there pretty quickly. So I kept it open for a minute and then I closed it and then I locked it. And I did this once a year, probably for the next decade, just to make sure it was really sticking. Because <laughs> um, you never know with that image. Even I mean, it's not like I actually Maybe I did when I was three, but by the time I was 13, it's not like I actually thought that's how it worked, but I guess that's just how I had processed it. And so you have to make sure that he didn't fall out one night, like in your sleep. Uh, but no, I mean, so for me, being a Christian is, the, it's always been the most important part of my life, my faith in Jesus. And then and I know that was the most important thing that my parents wanted to pass along to me. So that made it pretty hard. <laughs> Um, when then, even just I got to high school, I started to meet other, just meet openly gay people. This is before I even had come to terms with anything about myself. And I really started to feel a tension between, it just, I, the, from the moment that I met an openly gay person, the first thing I told my mom was, I said, I feel like this person wouldn't be welcome at our church. Even though I don't remember any hearing anything explicitly at church on this topic, you just knew because these people don't seemingly exist at all in your community or in the view of what is respectable, what is acceptable. We didn't have any family friends who I knew were LGBTQ. Every wedding, every family, all these things, heterosexual. Um, well, you know, fast forward to by the time I'm, well, no, before I fast forward, I'm gonna let my dad share a little bit just about his involvement and my parents' involvement in our church. Okay. So, um, as Matthew mentioned, our church was a Presbyterian church. And, and for those pastors who are here or others who know about denominations, it was a PCUSA church. And uh, uh, that denomination over the years has become more and more uh, affirming of gay people. Uh, but our particular church was really struggling with, with its relations with the denomination because our church was less and less affirming of gay people. And it led to 
um, our church leaving the denomination and joining a, a more conservative Presbyterian denomination. Uh, my wife and I had been part of this church for a long time and even before our children were born. Uh, we're very active in the church and, and found so much that was good about it uh, in, in theological training, in spiritual formation, uh, resources for our children, and lots of friendships for us. So this was really a, a foundation for our, our life, was our church. We were both elders in the church, and each of us at different times served on the, uh, the governing board of the church. Um, I had never studied uh, anything about the gay issue. Um, I wasn't gay. Nobody in my family was gay. I didn't know I had any friends who were gay. Uh, none, I didn't know I had any work associates who were gay. And so I didn't really take the time or invest the effort to study it. And on top of that, because I'm not gay, it's uncomfortable for me. And I didn't like to think about it, so I didn't. Uh, so, as Matthew alluded to, uh, our faith, my faith, my wife's faith, our family's faith, the most important thing in our lives. A close second to that is our family. We had, my wife and I had invested a lot of time and effort into creating a cohesive, supportive, loving family. And we're really blessed that we were seeing a lot of fruit from that. So I guess that leads to the next stage in our discussion. Yes. <laughs> um, so fast forward to when I'm in college and I because I was just living in, I think this happens especially with the generational difference, I felt like my sister and I were living in a different world than the world that my parents were living in because we were living in a world where LGBTQ people existed. <laughs> and not as an idea, but as friends, <laughs> as people we cared about. And that it was a real experience. Uh, like it was a real characteristic of some people. It was just a minority group in the world. It wasn't a choice. It wasn't a lifestyle. It was one of many minority groups and one that we were seeing, it was experiencing a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And much of that at the hands of rejection from the church. So I, I started to, you know, when I was my first year in college, I ended up doing a whole Bible study on this topic because I began to feel very, even before I ever <laughs> did any, ask myself the hard questions, I got to a point where I did enough study that I just became passionate about it, believing that it was a justice issue. And I was frustrated that in conversations with my parents that I felt like we were just not able to actually be talking to one another because it's like we had completely different understandings of what we were talking about in the first place. And that I was really seeing this as a justice issue and I felt like they had it wrong. <laughs> and I love and loved my parents and have a lot of respect for them. And so I didn't want to see them hurting people, even though I knew it wasn't intentional. I felt like their position hurt people and I didn't want that because I know that's not what they want to do. Um, I certainly know that's not what they want their faith um, to be about or for the impact of their faith to be. So after I became passionate about it on a personal level, six months later then I finally asked myself the question whether or not I was gay and it was incredibly obvious and also terrifying because even though I was at a place where it didn't raise any questions for me about my own relationship with God, it raised a lot of questions for me about my relationship with my parents, uh, with the church, where, you know, would I be able to find a church where I could be accepted and welcomed? And it just felt like I didn't realize how dependent I was on other people and relationships with other people. And it kind of felt like all of that potentially just was taken out from underneath me. It was pretty terrifying. Um, but I decided to, I came home that Christmas, um, and because my dad and I and my mom, we'd been having some somewhat tense conversations about this topic in the abstract, uh, my dad, he decided to do some research, right? right? And so he checked out every book from our church library on the topic of, quote, homosexuality. And 
they were all about something like deliverance from homosexuality, basically ex-gay books. And so he showed them to me, right? The first day I came home. Right. When I was already planning on coming out, he did not know that. He, he showed me these books and uh, basically he's like, I've been doing some study since we talked about it. And I was like, oh, this is not the type of study I was hoping you'd be doing. <laughs> and so I think I said something to the effect of, you know, I'm not gonna read books about how women can't do math or about how, you know, a particular race of people are inferior. So I don't really feel, like, to me, this feels like the same thing. And dad, you were like, well, that's not very open-minded. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you got me, it's not. <laughs> so, um, I, I, do you have anything else to say about that? Well, you did read the books. Yes, eventually. But at first, I was not exactly. I was a little, I was like, oh, no. no you read the books, and I, what was interesting to me about your comments about them were that you had seen different things in their stories than I had. I had seen people whose lives were a mess. And through therapy, had some wonderful things happen in their lives. Really like get, overcoming drug addiction. Get their lives in order in, a, in so many different ways. What did you see in those stories? Yeah, I saw people who were experiencing addictions, uh, whether you know drugs, alcohol, sexual addictions, all these things, people who had a lack of purpose and identity in their lives, people who just had a lot of struggles and also were gay. <laughs> And sometimes it was related in the sense that they were kicked out of their church and then they felt like they had no support and then they were just in a place where everything kind of felt like it was falling apart. But the chain stories were, I found Jesus, I got a part of a church, I got sober, <laughs> and I stopped having a bunch of one night stands and my life got better. And I thought, of course it did. <laughs> like, definitely and good for you. Um, but also like, that's not my experience at all. You know, from the first time I think I, you know, learned when I was, I don't know, five about sexuality and learned that, you know, sex is a gift for marriage, I'm like, okay, that's what I want to do. And I'm 29 and that's what I want to do. <laughs> and, uh, and so I just kind of felt like, look, like just because I'm gay, it doesn't change my beliefs and it doesn't change how important my faith is to me. And... So I don't see myself reflected in any of these stories because none of these people are people who have a good relationship with God, who are, you know, and who, fortunately I was not dealing with any of those challenges or addictions or anything like that. And so I just thought, well, dad, these aren't orientation change stories. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to that point, you showed me that in almost every one of these stories, even after all this wonderful story of change, at the end was commonly some little comment like, I still experience same-sex attractions, but I have all these great things in my life, including uh, opposite-sex marriage for several of them. And Matthew pointed out to me that, what does that mean, Dad? It means that they didn't change their orientation. And I had just completely missed that. Yeah, but before we actually had those conversations, um, I came out to him. <laughs> And I remember when he shows me these books and I'm already planning on coming out, I'm just like, this isn't gonna go well. Um, so I came out to my mom first. I'd already, I had already come out to my sister over Thanksgiving. And again, because she and I were just living in a different world, you know, she had also been on her own you know, process and was at a, you know, that it, she did not miss a beat uh, in terms of being completely supportive and affirming. And she's actually here. And this is her first TRP conference. And I'm so excited to have her here. So welcome, Christine. Um, and so, yes, and then I came out to my mom, who's also here, uh, and a couple days later, came out to my dad, was not excited about it. <laughs> um, but it went as well as it could have, I think, given where you were at and your understanding, and not in terms of not understanding that sexual orientation was not something that couldn't be changed. Um, and so you told me that I mean, I was shaking, you know, on your bed for like an hour. Also, this is like midnight on a Saturday night where we're going to church in the morning. I pick good times. Uh, 
And, I, you know, you told me that you loved me and you, you thanked me for sharing it with you because you said that it, you knew that it must be hard for me. Um, do, what else do you remember from that? All right, so uh, I was completely unprepared to hear this. Um, I, I told you that I had never really studied this issue. Nevertheless, I knew, I knew what the right answers were. I knew that God was not okay with this. Now, how did I know this? Well, in our church, even though it's not the church that preaches against this week after week, as some churches do. In fact, I'm not sure I've heard hardly anything from the pulpit about it. It was obviously clear that in our church, we believed the Bible. And the Bible is clear that God is not okay with this. And so if you're going to be a real Christian, you're going to believe what God says, and God says he's not okay with this. And I, even though I hadn't studied it, yeah, I did know that there were these passages in Scripture. And so I knew that I was right. Now, Matthew was telling me that he's gay and that he's been studying this for months now. He's very bright. And so I knew that he was way ahead of me on this issue. What he was asking me to do was to affirm him as a, as a gay man, even though my understanding was that God is not okay with it. Now, up until now, um, or up until then, there had never been any real conflict between the two most important things in my life, my faith in God and my family. Suddenly, it seems like those two things are terribly in conflict. And so, I, it, I, I told him several months later that that had been the worst day of my life because it was bringing into conflict the two most important things in my life. So, But to your credit, you did not tell me that that first night. To my credit. <laughs> he, did not, <clears throat> he did not make it about himself, and, and I really appreciated that. So Matthew asked me if I would study this issue and really consider changing my mind about it. So I said, okay, let's do this. Let's study it together. Now, you might think that this is just a really magnanimous, uh, fatherly thing to do. My thinking on it was, I have invested so much time and energy and effort and money into my relationship with my kids, including this boy here who I love dearly. I don't want to wreck that by saying, Matthew, I'm not going to affirm you. And the best thing I can do for you is to steer you away from this. I could see that that would be potentially the end of our relationship. So as kind of a cop-out, I said, Matthew, let's study it together. And I could envision then as we studied the Bible, he would see in black and white that God is not okay with this. And God would be the one telling him that and not me. <laughs> so I committed to do that. Now, I felt like I would, in good faith, do that with an open mind, even though I knew in advance what the right answer was. And so that's what we undertook as our study of Scripture. And I think he admirably does keep an open mind about a lot of things, um, and that was demonstrated in our process. So we, because I had done some Scripture study already, but I took, we took it to another level. <laughs> So I started buying every book or resource that I could find. And the first text that we really worked through together was Genesis 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I remember back in high school when I was first feeling concerned and conflicted about our church's position on this topic, I remember I asked my dad one day, you know, why is it again that we're supposed to be against gay rights? <laughs> and he got out his Bible, he opened it to Genesis 19, 
and he read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where you have these angel visitors from God sent in the form of men to the city of Sodom, where Lot, Abraham's nephew, invites them into his home, shows them lavish hospitality, but then all the men, both young and old, from every part of the city of Sodom, surround the house, call out to Lot, bring out the men who came to you tonight so that we can have sex with them. Lot says, no, no, don't do this wicked thing, for these men have come under the protection of my roof. Here instead, I have my virgin daughters, do with them what you will, which is horrifying. Um, and yeah, Lot does not need to be winning any parenting awards. Uh, but, and then after that, the angel visitors thwart the men's attack plan, blinding them. They tell Lot and his family to flee. God destroys the city with fire and brimstone. So my dad kind of just read that to me and said, look, they said, we want to have sex with these men. And look what God did. He destroyed the city with fire and brimstone. And I remember when I was in high school, I was like, that doesn't feel right to me. That doesn't sound right, but I don't know what to say about that. But when we went back to that text after I'd come out, it started to look a little bit different because suddenly the question that he was asking when he approached the text changed. The question was not, what same-sex anything can I find referenced in any context in the Bible and is it positive or negative? The question was, I have a son who is gay, who would like to have a relationship that is similar to the relationship that you have with mom. What does the Bible have to say about that type of relationship? And then when we went back to that text, what did, how did it strike you? You know, it struck me pretty quickly uh, that almost a feeling of embarrassment that I had not ever really tried to understand what was going on in that passage. I mean, I'm an attorney, that's what I do for my career, and a lot of that involves some pretty detailed deconstruction of statutory language to try to really understand what the legislature was trying to communicate in that. Uh, and I'm pretty good at that most times. <laughs> and so when I looked at this and saw obvious problems with this story applying to our situation, I was actually pretty embarrassed about it. Uh, all the men from the whole city, young and old, who are married, they all want to have sex with these men. Does that make any sense? And then on top of that, remembering that back in those days, in war, when one side vanquishes the other, they don't usually kill them all. Oftentimes when they surrender, when one side surrenders, the other side not only has vanquished them on the field of battle, but gives them the ultimate humiliation of raping them, treating them like a woman. In a time when that was seen as the lowest you could be in society. Right. And this, that makes perfect sense of this passage then. It was a passage about domination and violence and inhospitality and against God's commands to be hospitable to his people. So I was actually pretty embarrassed about uh, my prior understanding of this passage because it wasn't that hard to really understand it once we dug under the surface. But there are five more passages. <laughs> and so that didn't change my mind about my ultimate conclusion, but it did cause me <laughs> to say, okay, let's, let's look at these others uh, with a little bit more uh, seriousness and depth. And I think it really then, it did, it, and you've told me before too that it made you realize if I was wrong about that one, is it possible that I was wrong about some of the other ones too? Right. And I think that's instructive, not just for individuals, but in realizing that from about the time of Augustine in the fifth century all the way through the middle of the 20th century, that was the consistent interpretation of the church, of the Sodom and Gomorrah story, was that it was about same-sex relations. And it's interesting because a lot of non-affirming Christians today will acknowledge that, okay, that, 
that's not what Sodom and Gomorrah is about, but these other texts. But I think we have to take it seriously that for 1,500 years, now we all act like, oh yeah, we know that that's not what that's about. That's new. <laughs> Understanding that that's not what Sodom and Gomorrah is about is new. And if the church collectively was wrong about that passage for 1,500 years, is it possible that we need to apply some more nuance to some of these other passages as well? So after that, we moved right along. We chugged right along to Leviticus. <laughs> and and let, let me interject something here that I meant to say earlier. Um, because my faith in God is the most important thing in my life, and Matthew's asking me to change my understanding of part of that, I am, I am just not going to do that just in order to uh, protect my relationship with him, even though I value it so much, because I, uh, I understand that my primary relationship is to God. So this study of scripture was really necessary for me in order to ever be able to get to the point of saying, okay, Matthew, I can affirm you in what you're asking me. And so this whole process it did not happen quickly. I think we went about six months through it, uh, but it was really necessary for me before I could ever get to that point. Yes, yeah, so when I said we just moved right along, we didn't really just move right along. It wasn't all in one sitting. And oftentimes too, you know, it's, there were times where you just need, I actually took a whole semester off from college that semester because I really value and valued my relationship with my parents and I wanted to work through this conversation. And I was like, college can wait. <laughs> Like, and so just being able to be present every day for eight months that semester in the summer allowed us to also talk about other things <laughs> and allowed him to also see that I'm still the same person who I was before, with the same personality, the same passions, the same values, that that hasn't changed. I think that was a helpful ingredient too. Amen. <laughs> but eventually we made our way to Leviticus. Um, where there are two prohibitions of male same-sex relations in Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13, and the death penalty is even applied in Leviticus 20.13, and it's termed an abomination. So these are, the, these are the verses that you often will see on protest signs at pride parades or that sort of thing, um, because they are the most kind of direct um, and stark references to same-sex relations in all of Scripture. There also is a kind of immediate challenge that comes up with those verses when it comes to how Christians think through various topics. Do you wanna talk about how you were thinking about that, Dad? Well, again, even though I had been a Christian for a long time and had actually studied a fair amount about the Bible, a little embarrassed in not recognizing more clearly the place of the Old Testament law for Christians in our faith. And as we studied this, I mean, I know when we got into it, I was thinking, okay, this is very direct language here. There's not a lot of nuance. So Matthew, how are you gonna deal with this? And as we studied it, I came to remember the place that the Old Testament law has for Christians. Because for Jews back in that time, there were 613 laws that they had to follow, or do their best to follow. We don't have 613 laws to follow. Why not? Because Christ is the end of the law. Jesus fulfilled the law, and the old law has passed away in favor of the new covenant. And that makes all the difference for those passages. You take it from there? Yes, and it's certainly, it's still worth considering and exploring, you know, what was the rationale behind various prohibitions, even if they don't apply to us today, it's relevant to consider why might that be in there. It's a little challenging because the Bible itself does not tell you this was the exact reason, right? Um, it does, it's not annotated in that sense, but certainly as we studied it further, 
what kept coming up consistently in a lot of scholarship around this was similar to what Dad said about the experience of gang rape. And not that the Levitical verses are about, about rape necessarily, they're not just about that, but about that idea, especially in a deeply patriarchal society where women had few to no rights and were seen as inferior in their very being to men. That was the society that shaped the ancient world, the biblical world. For a man to be seen as being treated as a woman was the ultimate degradation. And so even if it was consensual, it was still seen as stripping him of his masculine honor um, by, quote unquote, reducing him to the status of a woman. And it's important to ask as Christians, is that a value system that we believe is actually part of the full witness of scripture? Or is patriarchy a part of the backdrop to, the, you know, to God's people and the setting of scripture, but a backdrop that ultimately God, the Bible, and Jesus are pointing us away from? And there are a lot of, and certainly even Christians today who hold more conservative views on gender, do not say that they believe that women are inferior in value to men. Their mantra is that equal value, different roles. And I mean, I don't ascribe to complementarian theology that relegates women to a subordinate social status, but even those who do, don't actually hold the same underlying viewpoint that shaped the ancient world. And that's important to consider because it's not just saying, oh, well, these were there, but fortunately they don't apply. It's like, but also the rationale for them is something that as Christians, we see Jesus pointing us away from, pointing us toward the equal treatment, the equal dignity, and the equal rights of women. And so that's just an important thing, I think, to add to the mix. Right. And as we saw, there were a number of other of these laws that Christians today don't follow at all. And we have no qualms about that. Uh, some of the dietary laws, for example, and, and a number of others. And um, even though many of those are also considered abominations. And now that word, that word is so uh, negative. Uh, so Matthew, maybe you ought to speak for just a minute about what the understanding of that word is. Well, I mean, laws. it certainly is negative, and don't get me wrong, anything that was a part of those 613 laws, anything that was condemned, was certainly treated very seriously. All of the prohibitions, you know, even working on the Sabbath, received the death penalty in Exodus 35, verse 2. So it's, and so certainly the word abomination, it's not that that was not a strongly negative term, it's that it was applied to a much broader range of things than you can't just make a one-to-one -one ethical kind of translation to say, well, not everything in the Old Testament applies to Christians, but if it was called an abomination, then that applies. Because even in other sexual prohibitions, having sex during a woman's menstrual period was also prohibited, was called an abomination, and the punishment was permanent exile. That isn't something that is considered, you never hear people preaching about this. This is not considered an ethical transgression. And so people tend to look at that and they're like, well, that was more of a purity issue right, within certain purity codes. But it's just, it just goes to show that even though the language is certain, and even in Ezekiel actually charging interest on loans, not just excessive interest, but charging any interest on loans, was called an abomination, the penalty was death, and the language is identical to the language in Leviticus 2013 for the punishment, saying that their blood will be on their own heads. So we just have to make sure we're being consistent. And just because something was treated as starkly negative for reasons that I think have more to do with the historical particularity of the patriarchal backdrop of scripture, that does not answer the question for how Christians should be engaging um, or thinking about that topic today. Uh, but, so shall we then move forward um, to the New Testament? Uh, do you wanna say anything or do you want me to start about the New Testament? Go for it. Okay. So I think what probably as all of you know, the longest passage in scripture that says, that refers to same-sex relations is two verses long. Not that long, really. Um, and it's in the book of Romans, Romans chapter one, verses 26 to 27. Paul in Romans one is talking about how all people 
are, in Romans 1 to 3, is talking about how all people are fallen, all people are in need of reconciliation to God, in need of the salvation that Jesus offers. In Romans 2, he talks about how, he talks to his fellow Jews about how even one violation of the law renders them in need of reconciliation with God. But in Romans 1, he makes an argument for why Gentiles also, even though they don't have the, the written law to violate, they know about God's existence through the fact of creation, that the creation itself attests to the existence of a creator. And then he talks about how, but there were people who, even though they knew the reality of God and the existence of God, they willingly turned away from God to worship idols, flat-footed, four-footed four creatures. And they then, as a result of them knowing God, turning away from God, essentially, the paraphrase, the message version of this would be that God said, okay, if you don't want me at the center of your life, then go live your life with other things at the center and see what happens. And it doesn't go very well. There's a whole list at the end in Romans 1, 28 to 32 of 21 different vices. These people have no faithfulness, no love, no mercy. They are murderers. Uh, there are all sorts of terrible things that they do. But he also talks in Romans 1, 24 to 27, um, which you can hear about in much more depth on Saturday afternoon in a workshop by Dr. Jim Brownson, um, who has written an excellent exegesis of Romans 1 that you should read in Bible, Gender, Sexuality. I like to put in my plugs. Uh, but in he talks about God giving people over to, to shameful lusts, and that even their men, that their women exchanged natural for unnatural relations, and that even their men, or even their women, exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones, and their men likewise abandoned natural relations with women, became inflamed with lust one for another, and committed shameful acts um, among themselves. And then he, they talks about, and then he goes on to say that they're gonna receive the due penalty for their error. So that's clearly pretty negative. Um, but when we were sitting down and talking about it one day over our, over our breakfast table, I remember pointing out to my dad, I said, okay, like, yes, clearly this is very negative. And also, it's talking about people inflamed, consumed with their lusts and their passions. And it says explicitly that these people have no love and no faithfulness. And so I was just like, dad, this doesn't sound like the type of relationship that I want to have. This sounds like a fleeting, self-seeking, excessive um, lustfulness. And I agree, that's not something that, as Christians, we should be doing. Uh, but that isn't the sort of relationship that I want to have. I don't want to have fleeting encounters. I want to have a relationship based on commitment, love, faithfulness, the very same things as you. Like, isn't, like, I, I remember I asked you one time, I said, we would never take a passage that was condemning lustful heterosexual relationships and say, well, all straight people need to be single and celibate for life because nothing good can come out of, you know, Nothing good can come out of Bethlehem. <laughs> um, nothing good can come out of that sexual orientation. Uh, so, remember when I was kind of pushing back on that a little bit? I remember. What did you, how are you processing that? <laughs> well, it opened my eyes to uh, take another look at this passage and see, that's right. He is talking about people consumed with lust which he understood to be an excess of passions. And that was not your situation. That was not what you were looking for. And I was beginning to understand that that's the case with many, many, many gay people. They were looking for the kind of a relationship that was everything like the one I have with my wife, except they have a different orientation. Uh, and, and that gave me a lot of pause about that passage. But it also said that it was unnatural. What are we going to do about that, Matthew? <laughs> um, that's right. And that's, the, that's kind of the main point that came up. He's like, okay, yes, it's not talking about loving, committed relationships, but it does say it's unnatural. And so that would seem to indicate that there's a deeper problem here than just the lustfulness. Uh, that it also and somehow goes against God's created order. And th therefore, that's why all same-sex relationships are prohibited, even if they have all these positive qualities. And I don't remember quite when I got to this point, but I think eventually I took us to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, also written by Paul, where 
he's talking about hair length and he says, does not nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. And what's really interesting about this, the, the, words, the, the word for nature there is phusis in Greek. That is the same word that Paul uses in Romans 1 to say unnatural, para fusen. same word. And then in Romans 1, Paul also says God gave them over to shameful lusts, and the word for shameful is atomia in Greek. That's the same word he uses in 1 Corinthians 11 when he says it is a disgrace, atomia. And so I just thought, you know what, dad, do you agree with that? Do you think that it's disgraceful for a man to, long have, to have long hair? Like not just not preferable, <laughs> but disgraceful. You know, I, I have longer hair than a lot of <laughs> men do. Uh, and it was longer uh, earlier in my life. But you were a hippie. No, that, was, that just seemed so obvious to be a cultural thing. Men's hair length is, is a cultural thing from different times and different cultures. And, and so if Paul was talking about something cultural like that, using the same language as he was using in Romans 1 for uh, men having sex with other men out of uh, an excess of lust and passion. Is it possible that he is also reflecting something culturally from back 2,000 years ago instead of today? And as we researched more about the, the ancient context of understandings of same-sex behavior, same-sex relationships, same-sex attraction, it became clear that there was a big difference between how we were talking and our modern understanding of sexual orientation and anything that we see reflected in ancient literature or the few biblical references to same-sex behavior. That in ancient times, same-sex behavior as it was typically and widely practiced often was an excess of passion. You would have men who were married to women who, in addition to that, would be having sex with male, with men and women who they enslaved, with prostitutes, male and female, um, or in the most grotesque example, this was most common in ancient Greece, but was still practiced in different ways in Rome, pederasty, which was sexual relationships between adult men and adolescent boys. And we're not talking in any of these cases about monogamous, faithful relationships between social equals. There was always this hierarchy of status, whether it was age, whether it was you were slave or free. And that, to me, I was like, okay, there's some, and so then it was really interesting to hear some ancient writers talk about same-sex attraction and compare it explicitly to drunkenness and say it's just like people who've had you know, too much to drink, and then the same things just don't, they don't give them the same thrill anymore, so they just add more condiments to the mix. There's one ancient writer who says this literally. They add more condiments to the mix, just to try to add more salt, but it just doesn't satisfy them, and then these same people are going off, and these men are even having sex with boys, and, uh, you know, other males, and that sort of thing, because they just can't, their, their passions just can't be satisfied. It's just this never-ending, um, you know, pursuit. And that, I mean, there is truth to that idea that it, if you're just pursuing excess, it ultimately never does satisfy you. It does leave you feeling empty. But it was fascinating to see how consistently and widely that was the analogy that was used to talk about same-sex behavior. Not, no references whatsoever to this being a unique or different sexual orientation, and there were no references in any Christian literature until, that I have found until 1953 that would acknowledge that there were gay people who would have to be single and celibate for life if the church held on to its prohibition of same-sex relationships. And so I was saying, it doesn't seem to me like Paul is talking about gay people. And so some people said, oh, he's talking about straight people who are acting gay, but that's a little bit too reductive because that's an anachronism. This whole idea of gay and straight, these were not the categories that were used in ancient times. And so, He's just talking about people who he just sees as normal people in the same way anybody might have too much to eat, might have too much to drink, anybody might get too lustful, have too much sex, and a common manifestation of that in the ancient worldview was that it would manifest in same-sex sex. 
And so to me, it's like, okay, this kind of helps make sense of what he's talking about, but also this feels like a world apart from the conversation that we are having. Amen. So I became very impressed by that. We better go on to the next, the yes. last couple passages. Yes. So, I mean, then there are, there are two, two more passages in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, and 1 Timothy 1, verse 10, where there are two Greek words that are used, arsenikoitai and malakoi. And starting in 1946, in the RSV version of the Bible, that began to be, those terms in 1 Corinthians 6 began to be translated as homosexuals for the first time. I mean, that word didn't exist in English until 1892. There was no concept that was equivalent to that. There is no ancient word that is equivalent to that concept. So, but starting in the mid 20th century, this, this began to be translated as saying homosexuals. And then a few decades later it was updated to practicing homosexuals. And then, you know, people kept, because it's the wrong category. So they were like, well, okay, we didn't want to condemn the celibate gay people, we'll change it. It's like, I think this is a sign you may have made a mistake earlier on. Um, and we're actually gonna be having an, uh, a whole talk about those two passages tomorrow night. Um, featuring Kathy Baldock and Ed Oxford. So I will let them do the lion's share of the discussion of that. Um, but what we came to see as we studied it more was that there was significant debate about what exactly these terms were referring to. And the whole framework for thinking about and talking about same-sex relationships back at that time just didn't really match what we were talking about relationships that were not based on equality, mutuality, and commitment, based on hierarchy, and oftentimes the pursuit of status, lust, excess. Like, so in, I think that helped to realizing it got real technical. Those passages get really technical, and it's important to go there, but you can also step back and still realize that whatever these two words are speaking to, it doesn't change the fact that there's a big gulf that we've now recognized between the context of the biblical writers for thinking about this topic, really, in some ways, it's wrong to say this topic. It was a different, like, it's not, a, the topic was not LGBTQ people. The topic was not committed monogamous same-sex relationships. Like, for thinking about same-sex behavior. And that's a pretty broad spectrum. I don't think any straight people in this room would like to be judged by the most lascivious behavior of any other straight person on the planet. Um, and so, you know, we wanna make sure that we're just recognizing that that gap matters. And then to wrap this up, finally, uh, I had then come to the point that I said, okay, these, these six passages are not a definitive statement of what God thinks about uh, a committed, loving, same-sex relationship. That wasn't the end of the story for me, but it did cause me to, I mean, there's a, there's a whole nother category of, okay, those are, I've, we've thought about these passages, the negative passages, but what about positive things? What does the Bible have to say about marriage? And is that consistent? with a same-sex marriage. We're not gonna get into that here, that's another whole conversation. Uh, but I was currently serving on the governing board of our church at the time, at the time when our church was seriously considering breaking away from our denomination and becoming even more conservative on this. And I had to ask myself, what as a church are we telling somebody who is a young gay person, what are we saying they need to do in order to fully live out a Christian life? Is it really right to say, well, you can be gay, but you can't live that out in your life. You can't engage in same-sex behavior. And therefore, you just cannot have the kind of intimate, committed, uh, relationship like my wife and I have, which is so foundational for my life and for the lives of so many people in our church. We would never give that up. And, and there's yet no good we're, reason why you should. And we, yet we're telling young gay people, you can't have that if you're going to live as a Christian. That 
it, it dawned on me that that was just unworkable. That is not uh, a workable solution, especially when you factor in the I mean, when the church says, when the church could say, well, just change. There, you can change. Well, once we realize you cannot change, and, and the change organizations out there finally give up and say, yeah, we've been wrong all this time. None of our people have changed. Then, you're, as a church, you're not offering these people something to change too. You're just saying you cannot have this kind of a relationship for the rest of your life. And that's what I found to be unworkable, uh, uh, an unworkable message for the church to give people. And we ended up leaving our church as the church left the denomination and became more conservative on that. Is that how you want to end it up? Or do you want to end it with something a little more positive? Yeah. <laughs> I think what I would close with was just, it was... When you were just sharing earlier about, at the very beginning, when you were kind of at that fork in the road of realizing that if you were to tell me this is just how it is, I do not affirm you, that, that was even hard to think about because it would have fundamentally changed our relationship. And you would have still been my dad and I still would have loved you, but it would have been incredibly alienating. Um, and it would have been deeply, deeply disappointing. Um, and I, I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to think about what that would have been like and how different the trajectory of my life over the last 10 years would have been. I don't think I could have started this organization. <laughs> I don't think, I, don't, I mean, I don't think the Reformation Project would exist. <laughs> um, and I would not have written my book. I, like all these things where it's just like, you supporting me and mom, that is so important and it has made such a difference in my life. And I'm just incredibly grateful for you and for that. And, and I'll end it up by saying, uh, as important as my family is to me, uh, God is more important. And I, I didn't reach this position because I decided to put my family over my faith. I reached this position because I realized that my faith was imperfect and it needed to be better. Amen. Thank you.